Hello, everybody. A warm welcome to Wisdom from North, the Nordic platform for personal development and spiritual growth. I'm Janneke, and if you're new to my channel, as always, welcome here. I'd love for you to subscribe. You do that below, and if you click the bell, you get notifications of my new videos. Today, I'm excited to be here with Carlos Werther. Carlos is a spiritual activist and acclaimed author of more than 20 books and a psychiatrist. And he went from studying at Harvard to study with Dalai Lama, Sufis, Hindus, and shamans in the jungle, who he said cleared out more of what he thought he knew. Carlos is passionate about helping people pursue their sacredness. And I'm excited to learn from Carlos' perspectives. So let's meet him. Hello, Carlos. Welcome. How are you doing? Very well, Janneke. And talking to you is an inspiration. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. I've been looking into your work and it's highly inspirational. And there's so many things I want to go into today. Uh, what I wanted to start with, I saw on a video that you made or a podcast, I can't remember, but you talked about that in our modern society, a lot of us pursue happiness and security. But this might be a conflict actually with the truth of the universe, which is about evolution and change. So let's go there. Can you expand on that? Yes, indeed. Our society has forgotten sacredness, wholeness, the experiences that lead us to totality and individuation. We are taught different things. We're taught that in order to get happiness, we have to pursue and have the material universe, which is unhavable. So people graduate from their schools and go to a job and think that after 40 years of hard work, and they like hard work, especially in America, they will be happy and be complete. And they've set themselves up, we set ourselves up to disillusion. And instead of using the disillusion to break the illusion that we have been in, we cry, we get depressed, we react with our psychoneurology in a way that doesn't allow us to progress. So happiness, not only is it achievable in the spiritual quest, but it is a given because the appreciation of living life, life, life is so happy and so complete and so beautiful and so heartfelt instead of headfelt, but it but it goes to the head too, because if we can say, I feel happy, I am happy, then we show a quality of our being, not a quality of, I'm happy because I got a new car. I'm happy because I got a new wife. I'm happy because I have children. Yes, they are moments of happiness in those situations. But what you and I, I think, are talking is a sustained place of happiness. Then when we get up in the morning, we're happy to be alive. We're grateful to be alive. When we meet and I have interactions with people, I am so happy to serve them because where I live, where I come from is beingness. Let's call it that way. And I'll shut up. <laughs> Oh, no, I would love to hear more. So, yeah, beingness uh, sounds so simple in a way, just be. What does that really mean? I, I, it seems like something we're striving towards, and it's something that is so innate and uh, natural for the soul, but for us 
uh, as human beings on this planet, it just doesn't seem that easy. And um, I, I guess we're hooked into this notion that when I get the security and when I get all this, then I can relax. And maybe it has something to do with the fear and our biology. I don't know, that says danger, danger, if I'm not you know, fully secure in my uh, in my life. So how could I be happy just in the moment when I don't know if I can pay my rent tomorrow, or I don't know if I will ever achieve my dreams or get that job or that love. Maybe I'll, I'll never find love. You know, all those fears I, I feel like is driving us. So how can we open to that happiness for just being alive? Well, a short answer, short answer is like I was telling you before this, uh, it's opening our heart. And now opening our heart doesn't mean possession of something. Doesn't mean there's a cycle, like it's being, doing, and having. We live concentrated on doing things in order to have them. And I'm talking about being outside of this circle. Of course, there's always a position that we call identity. It's not identity, it's position. I am a doctor, it's a position. I have a house, it's a position, it's not an identity. And I tell you that this from experience in two avenues. I will remember a man that was meditating in India many years ago, and I walked by him, I touched his forehead, and he was burning in fever. So immediately I ran to the house where I was staying and got an aspirin. First, one aspirin to remove the fever. I gave it to him and he said, thank you very, very much. But take it back. Use it for someone who is really sick. It was so moving. I said, you need it. And he said, the fever will go away, but I am here. I can tell you a different story. There was a time in my life in which I lost every penny I had due to a broker that stole it from me. And it's 22 years, so I can speak really from a place of observing the whole situation instead of how I spoke the first months, which was in pain, anger, and grief, because there was a loss. And I had four kids and a wife to support, since I was the only, as they say, breadwinner. And I did. And I moved from a place that we're calling today beingness, I amness, through the attack of stress that was produced there. And not only did I survive, but I survived enriched to know that who I am is really not dependent on paying the rent. Since they evicted me, I couldn't pay the rent. So I know very well that. And not only did I learn something, but it became a second nature to be able to express that in a certain moment, I even forgave this guy who stole from me and said, I have nothing against you, but this is what I do. What a attack on good judgment he had. And I was obviously mad and obviously in fear how I'm gonna support them. And I supported them because Jesus, and I'm not quoting Jesus religiously, but teaching wise, I wrote a book about Jesus beyond the corporate franchise of the church. The teaching says there's always a rock to put our head, even in the desert, so we can sleep with that pillow. And it really touched me because I came to a point of really having nothing. I could still do and produce. I could still do and raise the family. But the being that I am was intact. So I'm pointing to a separation of what I like to call, and if you read Recovery of the Sacred, did you read that? Sorry? Did you read Recovery of the Sacred? No. One of my, 
Well, I explained in Recovery of the Sacred the distinction in our life between what I call the big story and the small story. The small story is what we consider daily life. Everything that happens in daily life becomes a memory. And we have the choice when we continue to go and look at the memory, to remove its weight, and this is part of my work, to remove the trauma that is there so that we can access, not through this, but access through spiritual exercise, the big story, which is the story of our soul. The soul is transcendent. I, I just read a little uh, mem of two babies, twins, in the womb. And one says, one day we will be out of here. The other says, I don't believe it. There is no life after here. Yes, there is. We will be breathe air like mom. And the other says, what are you talking about? Who is mom? Oh, we are in her womb. And thanks to her, we get nourishment. But then we will be independent. And the other says, you are crazy. We are only living while we have the umbilical cord. And parenthesis, some people do that adult, but it's another story. So then the distinction between this aerial world, this world that we live in, and the baby inside the womb, water world, allows me a space to go beyond what we call here this space, this universe, this reality, which is impermanent, naturally impermanent, and access a beautiful place of light, which is also containing us and towards where we go. We don't go just to dust. This goes to dust because it comes from dust. But I'm not this. Who I am is the whole meaning of the work. And from there you choose. You choose to have an interview. You choose to be a doctor. You choose to be in a relationship. But don't forget that you choose. So we are, I am totally responsible for what happens there. But what happens there in India, they call karma, a working out of processes that we assist each other not to have a fight or even a teaching, but to transcend it to move from now to eternity into the observer place. And I touched my eyes and shut them because the observer looks from higher than the physical eyes, looks from a place of love, looks from a place that we call soul. And you asked me about my work, and I work like you, organically. I work with who people bring, what people bring, who they are in order to help them, to assist them, to release the weight that human beings carry because of false teaching, false information, false information that we are what we do. And here goes a person for the next 70 years doing, 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 and at the end says, what? I am empty inside. I have a million or a billion. Now we have a billion. <laughs> My days is only a million. But the funny thing is that that doesn't give them contentment. I have worked with so many people who are corporation CEOs, presidents of companies, founders. I work sometimes in, uh, what's it called? Well, it's presidents, young president organization. And I see the emptiness, not only the emptiness of their beingness, but the emptiness that their achievement has given because it's not in achieving. 
it's not in getting love. You mentioned the word get, and when you said that, I underlined it in my mind. I said, I have to go there. We have been taught to be go-getters. And I'd like to become a go-giver. That was beautiful. Thank you. A go-giver. Yeah. Yeah, I just talked to a friend of mine, and we so often have these projects, you know, where we put in so much energy. I, I remember I just heard the story with this uh, big pop artist and it was all about that next album and they worked so hard, you know, sweat and tears for this album. And then it's done, it's released. And then there's this moment of joy, but he said it so quickly disappeared. All this hard work, built up to this moment. And then he felt so empty after that joy feeling, which lasted so shortly. And I just thought about uh, that story when, when you were talking. I'd love to move deeper into this. But before that, I heard that you had a divine experience where you left your body and it could be uh, inspiring for people to learn a bit about how this has been an actual experience for you, uh, which it seemed to be that you're actually living this. It's not just a concept in your mind. It's actually something that is true to you. And I was fascinated by that story. And I would love for you, if you want to share it, you were sitting at this restaurant with your um, partner and friends, and all of a sudden you left your body. I'd love to hear what happened. What really happened is that we were in our house and there was uh, my wife, my cousin and his wife, and we're eating and talking and having a beautiful time of sharing. And I tell my wife, I don't feel so good. And the next second, I am looking at the table, at the people that are there from outside the house, not only outside my body, but I was with beautiful stars and lights around. And a silver light was peaceful and loving in my heart. And I was in a different place, a beautiful place, a place that having been given this experience, which people call a near-death experience, but I call it a life experience because it transcends. I look down and I see the panic of my wife. And I see my body there. And she's doing CPR and pressing my body. I feel nothing in the body. I'm gone. And then I see my cousin going insane, finding a phone, forgetting that now the phones are not others to call 911. He finds it. And now I choose, consciously choose, because I see the suffering of my partner. And I don't want her to have pain. And I can see that she's afraid of being alone now. And we have a nice togetherness. And I turn inside this space. And with the light surrounding me, I choose to re-enter the body. But before, I, before that, can you linger a bit in the space? How did it look like? Was it nice? Was it beautiful? How did you feel yourself? Did you see yourself as something else? Or who were you? I have tons of questions just there. <laughs> tons of questions. Let me start with the first one. Who were you? I am the same anywhere. Because I have discovered the thing that one of my teachers said, human beings have forgotten only one thing, that they're human beings. <laughs> this beingness, this I amness, as we can call it in this language, was, is, with me in that space, which was a place of absolute peace, absolute love. There was no more to pursue than relaxing in it. The light was silver. And as it went further, it became more silver. 
and lately turning into a shine of gold. And I know there was a path towards this. I know it was beautiful. It was holding me, it was sustaining me. It cared more for me than anything and anybody that I've experienced here. But here, what we call daily life, for which I am grateful, I'm 75 years old. So I've seen a lot in my life and in others. And I'm not 75 years old. I am now. I'm eternal. And that connects with an experience that I had when I was 14, which began to set me towards the path. I was looking at a clock in some kind of meditation without calling it meditation. And I was repeating the word of my mother tongue, jetzt, which is now in German. And I was seeing that the clock was moving and it was five and 10 past three. But I had entered into a space of nowness, which was forever. And I could distinguish, and I, I wrote a book about it. I'm doing a three, three retreats this year about it. One in September, one in December, and one I think in February or March of next year. Hopefully I'm alive and do it. And it, it's, called, it's time to enjoy your life. Because to enjoy our life, we have to leave the construct which now physicists are beginning to mathematically tear apart. The construct that we call space-time. Space-time is our imagination. This is eternity. Having moments of nowness, nowness, nowness as an opportunity to elevate ourselves, to get out of the womb and cut the umbilical cord and be in a transcendent space like that womb, we don't carry the placenta on our back. And in that other place, since I saw my body sitting down there, we don't carry this body. We only progress through now into eternal life. This is not a religious concept, this is my experience. And it's not based on anything. It's not anything any teacher uh, you said it very well, took away from me. Because when I first started studying, I was a doctor, a new doctor. And I thought I knew a lot of things. And here I am, running in the jungle with some very tiny sandals, with these people who were jumping, running barefoot. And seeing that Harvard was interesting. But this was transforming. I could jump in the forest. I could take the substances from the plants that they were taking. I could open my heart, my mind, my soul, and move on. It was fantastic because it showed me that who I am is not a doctor, but it's also not a body. And it's definitely not my thoughts. That's not who I am. That's expressions in different moments. A wonderful guy called Terence McKenna, not longer with us, said 30 years ago, it will come the time in which who we are will use the body as they use a computer and the computer will be part of the possession of us. I have a body, I have a computer. But who I am is untouched. So what I'm saying is not just my experience. It's experience of many others, many people that are watching this probably. I have a patient, for instance, who had a transcendent experience and didn't compute it as such. He got scared. He became ill. And we're talking about that experience which the people that helped him have did not know that it was really an OBE, out-of-body experience. You don't need to have a near-death experience like I had. But through meditation, we can leave. 
and watch our body, what is happening to us, the other people, everybody that is around, we can feel, perceive love. And sometimes even take on their pain, not to have it, but to release it in the light of the universe. So in the healing world, which is a little larger than the medical world, we need more people that know that life is not just what we see with our physical eyes, but we can open what ancient traditions have called the transcendent, the third eye, the, the sixth chakra, to watch from above the sensory line of our hearing, seeing, smelling, and tasting. Kings, if they knew what they're doing, would wear a crown and move into that higher space to be real. Another word for royal, real. Now kings inherit things without the training, and they're not so real. It's just a form in the physical universe. But if you look at the esoteric universe, what did it mean that the crown didn't touch the line of sensory awareness and was above, and some very above? You know, the popes had that crown, and one of them, I think it was uh, Jean Paul, Jean Paul II, didn't get crowned because he didn't want the pomp. I met him, I spoke with him, and I said what I'm saying to you. I said that crown is a sacred tool to open you to a larger perception of the universe. And he thanked me. That was in the Vatican, where I got an audience in 24 hours. I was very fortunate. But the funny thing was that I was in the peace talks in Uruguay between Chile and Argentina a year later. And he came to be the signer of this peace between these two countries, which had relatively big armies against each other, which is absolutely stupid. Absolutely stupid. I mean, Argentina is not a country. It's a, it's a lost place without direction. And Chile at that time had a military dictatorship, which was painful for everybody, except some, of course, some. So what I'm intending to say is that we need to wake up so we can show up in the crown things. And this Kabbalah, for instance, shows saying that there is an animal soul and a divine soul to access. An animal and soul. Animal, animal. This is an animal. This is an animal. Okay, so they call it like a soul, like in the body is an animal soul. Yes, yes. Hmm, interesting. And this animal soul rules the physiological functions. It's not a despective term because we, listen, I live with four dogs. I call them dog beings. One is showing up there. I see the way we're dog and they show up. They're so loving. They're so caring. So when we talk about animal soul, we also say about kindness and caring and triumph and majesty and kingdom and foundation. I just gave you seven Kabbalah portals through the animal soul. But the beauty is that we have a divine soul. And it rules above our sensory world. It is a balance between discipline and loving kindness that we need to apply first to ourselves and then to others. And to ourselves, I think it takes a lifetime. It's a, it's a full-time job forever. <laughs> it's not, I got it, and now I go to something else. I had a good time, and I go to the next good time. You know, it's something for me. I don't know for others. 
to dive deeply and deeply and deeply because what is shown is only beauty. The frequency of ethics is higher than our behavior on the planet. Look at Russia and Ukraine these days, but there are examples throughout history. So it's not an impulsive reaction to the world, but it's an observer reaction. This is just so beautiful, everything you're sharing. And it's so much wisdom there, and there's so many places we can go. But since you mentioned now at the end, there's only beauty, and you mentioned the war as well. And then we see some souls who just, or people uh, mm -hmm. who have terrible, terrible experiences, for instance, in this war. It's a hard and gruesome to watch, but I can't imagine experiencing it. So what about those, you know, souls who are experiencing horrendous things? I mean, it doesn't feel beautiful. Because they're not conscious of soul. They're conscious of reactions in the human body. But what can you do? That's a very good question. I am slightly involved with an organization that's called One Humanity Institute. And we have two bakeries in Auschwitz, right next to the camp. In order to transform the place into a source of giving. And one of the houses is already habilitated, transformed to take refugees. So what can I do except helping, assisting, maybe even, even praying? that there is a transformation there. Souls don't suffer, people suffer. The emotional system of people suffers. The mental equipment suffers. The physical, of course. I mean, I've been sick many times and I have transcended. I have transcended because during, give you an example, a cancer chemotherapy, that I had last year, I framed it as a teaching moment for my divine experience. And here I am, healthy. Here I am, free of it. And even more, I was mentioning that one of the things we can do is take on the pain of others to release it. In my walks in this hospital, I would do that with the other people. Here I was sick, but I am not sick. The body was sick. I'm not my body. I have a body. Like I have a computer. Like I have a car. But it's not me. This is something that is useful. If not, we wouldn't be talking. We would be connected. But I'm not that. And then I have, I have a, a cancer. I had, I had a cancer. I had a meningitis. I had many things. And my reading of it was such that I went out of it. One of the doctors would come and sit with me for an hour every day, unheard of. And we would talk, like we'd talk. And he said, I have never seen anybody at the reframe speed that you have. Any bad news gets reframed and out. Some things linger for a week. But they linger. They're not me. I can say anything out there, but I cannot say the name of God. It's not spoken. But I can feel it. I can feel it in my animal soul. I can feel it in my divine soul. I can feel it in you. Because that's the reality. See, we're looking for the nature of reality. Long time with the Tibetans, that was the focus. I'll tell you something, which before I thought it was very confidential, but I'm gonna tell it to you because maybe it's legacy, I don't know. <laughs> maybe it's an invitation for you to come see. I spent a long time meditating in my life, and especially in the last few years before I got very sick. And 
and before this near-death experience, I had the question, and the question was this. Okay, Carlos, you're studied with Sufis, with Kabbalists, with uh, shamans, with uh, Hindu teachers, with the holiness, the Dalai Lama. You've met all these people. Now, let's see. This is the last moment of my life. All this is my history, but I'm not my history. I'm here, present with you. What is it, I asked, that happens in the last moment? And I got first the experience of the near-death experience. So, so, I, so you asked what is going to happen in my last moment? Yeah, what is the What is that moment when this story ends? Okay. And I was answered with a near-death experience. Oh. I was answered eating some vegetables from my garden with an infection in my men meninges, in my, in my brain. I was in coma for a week. I only remember little things from the coma, but I remember some. And then I was out and healed. But the question still lingered. What happens in the last moment? So I was asking for it. Then I got diagnosed with cancer. So I said, so what's the end of it? And I got a radiation treatment, which was heavy, but it was interesting. Because I remember one day I went to radiation at eight in the morning, and at 9.15 I was back teaching a 10-hour seminar. Two days of that. And I was fine, but I was radiated. I collapsed after that and slept 15 hours. And then I was fine. And then meditation was the same. What about the last moment? Maybe this is the guidance. But the answer had begun to come. Be at peace. My father, may he rest in peace, used to say the most important thing is to have peace in the heart. Everything else comes and goes. So then I had chemotherapy, as I told you before, and I reframed everything. I put it in different names. We have the right to read our history as we want to read our history because we're the sole responsible for our history. And then I survived that. And I keep asking the question of the last moment. I think this peace that I'm experiencing is a good vehicle. We focus very little on peace, even though thousands, millions, billions of people say, be at peace. Salam Aleikum, Shalom Aleikum, peace be with you. Wait, wait a minute. How do I get peace? Would be the question. I'm not recommending anybody to get sick. I'm recommending meditation and the right avenue of meditation because people meditate and they don't meditate they think a lot they're sitting there and in one moment of stop of thinking there is a moment of silence and they call that meditation so how many minutes of meditation do we really compute how many so this is not the right question the right question needs to guide us in a context. And that's, that's all nature of my work. I'm giving you a synthesis that is the work. In a context of achieving peace. Not just silence of the mind, which this monkey mind does all the time. It jumps from one place to another. And we watch it. This is my mind doing things. Listen, I've read all this. This is my mind's information. And I'll do this. I touch here, and it's neurology. I touch there, and it's Holocaust studies. And you touch there, and it's psychedelics. And here is spirituality of all kinds. This is, have you heard of Sai Baba? Sali Baba? Sai Baba was a saint in India, 40 yes. million followers. This, I don't know if you can see, there's a picture of him holding my oldest daughter. 33 years ago. 
So I've been around these people and learned from them and learned that the most important thing is that peace I was talking about. Wow. And you can ask me, how do you have peace if you can't pay the rent? Move. Move to a place that you can afford. <laughs> can you live above their affordness and suffer and suffer and suffer? Many people stay in a job that is not their vocation, but it pays them well. And you know what? That comes to an end when we change the question. What am I all about? What is peace? What is true in this whole story? So when you ask these questions, it seemed like life was giving you a lot of struggle. So people might get a bit scared about asking these questions. No, uh, it was giving me also a lot of joy. I live in a place of four acres that we planted fruit trees and we have a vineyard, I'm looking at it. And we had chickens that gave fresh eggs and bees that gave us honey. And I feel I'm the caretaker of this place, even though it's my place. I own it. But doesn't mean that I'll take it with me. Doesn't mean I struggle with it. I didn't even struggle with cancer. People would ask me, are you going to make it? I said, no. Are you going to die? No. Are you be a survivor with a call? No. What are you going to do? The only thing I know how to do is to live. I will continue living. And here I am. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the questions that bring struggle. It's the question that brings answers if the question is sincere. And the answers we might like and we might not like. We might say it's terrible and suffer through it and not come out of it. Because this whole living situation is a spiritual exercise. I have a wonderful family. In my eyes, they're wonderful. My oldest daughter is my gem. She's a physician in research. My second son is a psychologist doctor. My third one is a filmmaker. And the fourth one is in college too. And it's fine. It's beautiful. It's not because they are doing that that is beautiful. It's because I saw their being. I saw some of these kids being before they came. I saw them in the womb, literally two of them. That was a C-section. And I saw them before they came out. How much love can I have for that? This living representation of live life. I assisted the birth of the two olders in a water birth at home. They came out and swimming, they were. I took them out and gave them to my wife. And that's wonderful. This property, when I came in the first time, I said home. I never had said that. And I've lived, oh my God, I have lived all over the place. From Africa to England, all of America and South America. It worked. This seems very natural to you. Um, could you give some advice for those who haven't had that experience, who are not sort of where you are, on how can I live more with peace in my own life? Maybe there's a working mom having lots to do or chaos in the family. It's just all about getting you know the ends to meet and the timing to work. Everybody should be everywhere at the same time, stress, you know, all the expectations around us. How do we find that peace in that hectic life? First of all, that's a very good question. And I have to say, this is my obligation to the audience. Familiarize yourself with my work. Even come to four days in your life to a retreat. That's all I'm asking, to transform the ability of experience living so that the things that you want to have cleared, do it in the process of life itself without effort. 
Now, of course, you are mentioning my average student, I should say client, because they see me more as a thing that they use sometimes to instruct themselves to get out of the mess that you were describing. They're mothers and professionals. They're hippies and very formal people. I see them the same. And when I teach, the ambiance that gets created is transformative so that the question that you mentioned, how do I go to peace? How do I get peace? It's not getting peace. It's not going there and getting peace and getting into the mess again and fighting. No, you have to move your residence, your identity from a place of thinking, which is not your fault, a place that's the only thing that's educated in this world. There is no even emotional education in the schools. There is not even a spiritual inkling of education and move residence to your heart. So where do I recite? It's not here, but here. This one has questions that you mentioned. How do I move now with this love in my heart that I am feeling to the Republic of Peace, if you want to call it, to the space of peace that I cannot grab. I cannot grab the ocean. I can take out a little water and throw it around. But I cannot have the whole ocean. I can only see a drop. Same thing with the consciousness of peace. So I cannot grab it. But it allows me to recite there. And once an individual uses one's really rational brain, the crown that I was mentioning before, number one, the balance between what's called loving kindness and discipline. Because we need a discipline. Discipline means being a disciple. It doesn't mean being a disciple of so-and-so. It means being a disciple disciple of the inner work, that one begins to prioritize and balance with the outer world. There is a lot of people that don't even have a knowledge that they are a soul. And someday they have a mystical experience and they admire it and love it. And then they compute it as a memory. And this memory is, I had a good experience. I am not looking for that. I'm not looking for the experience. I'm looking for the residence. Where do I live? Do I really live in this place that I'm the, the servant and caretaker? Do I really live in my family, which I'm the servant and sometimes caretaker? I've been for sure. I don't live in my profession, even though I still practice 51 years. 51 years makes it a little easier because you get knowledge, you get to know some things. And when somebody is lost in the mud of this personal creation, let me make a parenthesis here. Our civilization disappears instantly if we turn off the light. We are all plugged in into the electric system through the internet one way, through the light in the streets another way. If we turn off the light, what do we do? It's all stopped. Now let's take that metaphoric state and close parenthesis. If we as beings turn off the light, don't make it the first priority. Absolutely make it a thing out there to pursue, to heal me in my mess. It's only one application. Let's say you're healed from this mess. You work balancedly. Lady, you take care of your kids, but you take care of yourself too. Because what are the kids going to learn from being a mess? But what from an enlightened mother that takes care of herself? Then they can resonate with that. They can imitate that. And then Go out into this mess, because it is. And instead of saying, 
I want everything. Saying I want peace. And it brings also everything. I was really saying, when I came into this property and I felt it was home, the woman that was the owner, beautiful Russian woman, connected. And she sold me the place, even though they ha she had higher bids. Because she said, you will make this place even better than what we made. And they had done a fantastic job in not the part I'm looking at, but in the lower part of the property towards the street. Apples and bananas and oranges and grapefruits and uh, pomegranates and other fruits that I don't know the name in English. You could live just from this. You could eat just from this. Sometimes I go back there to pick up some oranges and I come back with one. So I eat them all in the way. Same thing with the figs. Same thing with the parsimons, that's the name. So I live in heaven. And I call it Pardes, P-R-D-S. It stands for many things, among others, paradise. And people come to Pardes and stay in a different house that is like an Airbnb, that two minutes away. And we work 10 hours a day. And everybody says, everybody says, this is the best I've come. And they come back to another one, this is the best. I say, thank you very much. I know that the last one I did from my perspective was the best because it was during my 75th birthday and I moved to a different octave. I was speaking about the ethics. Then I moved to aesthetics because this beauty that has been shown is not just a place to be seen, it's a place to live in there. And it was a very good experience for me and for others. And then I told some people, never come back, please. What I have to give is already given. Don't mess around with it. <laughs> that was the message. And others come back and come back and come back because I feel like I'm a source of extensive experience and learning. You know, I experienced first the love and the vision. And then I went to teachers all over the world to see if my experience was a delusion, an illusion, or a true perception of reality. And, and what after, was the answer? It was the answer was the last one. And it was beautiful. It was beautiful because then I could go to another teacher of a completely different philosophical orientation and say, Master, this is what I have experienced. I remember a Tibetan master in Berkeley in 1972. I said, this is my experience. Should I join your group and study with you? And he said, let me see. No, you're calm and clear. Move on. And I moved on. Well, I guess when we have an experience, we can't take that away. Like there can't be an illusion in an experience, can it? Uh, if it's not on psychedelics. I know you studied that. We can't, we don't have time to go into that, but I'm, I'm thinking that an experience is an experience. It could be delusional. It could be made up. It could be observing what doesn't exist. But if you observe what exists and look in there, it is not affected by the same rules of perception because it is, it is so through us. It is not out there. It is within. And from within, suddenly, we're in a different world. But I'm curious, if, if we see something, and you, you say that it might be dissolutional, but we're still seeing it, aren't we seeing something that exists in the universe, that nothing is really an illusion because it exists somewhere? Everything is an illusion, even what we can touch. Yeah, but right. It yeah. is a space that is not illusion. If I see a rabbit here, I am delusional. There is not a rabbit. Now I see a rabbit. 
well, if I take a pill of a medicine, I won't see the rabbit anymore. I'll go look for peace. Because there is a lot of distractions in the path, a lot of teachings that take you to one place. And this teaching that I've learned is always going on. It's a continuous initiation. I have not graduated. Mm -hmm. I'm I love that. Yeah, it's, uh, I love what you said that, that it's still going on and it's taking you further and further. And I've interviewed a lot of people who have channeled, uh, for instance, Mary Magdalene and um, beings like that. And what they are communicating is that they are still learning where they are on the other side. And that used to puzzle me. Like in the beginning of my interviews, I was like, aren't they done learning? But then I did some more interviews and some more. And I realized, oh, there's never any any ending in learning and growing. Everything is expanding and changing all the time. So it's really about, it's not about, but for me, I see it as different perspectives and that even the universe is learning about itself. So yeah, it's really mind blowing. However, I want to thank you for this amazing interview today. Um, I could have talked with you for hours. Is there anything you want to say at the end? Uh, if there's a message you want to get across to our audience today? It's all okay. It's really okay. Just relax and move higher. You will watch yourself from a different point of view. And when you see a lot of point of view, you want to have yours. What is your identity, point of view in the service, as you were saying of this expansion, which is a continuum. I remember in a conversation in the living room in Dharamsala and his holiness living room, I asked him something when he said, it's all a continuum, 1989, it's all a continuum. And I said, here is my wife being the mother and breastfeeding my oldest child. And I'm sitting in this living room with him. And somebody is filming this thing and recording this thing. And I said, Your Holiness, should I be a monk? And he said, You've had that experience. Now have a boy, because this was a girl. Nine months later, we had a boy. And he's growing into that consciousness. From psychology to transcendence, there is a road. Many take it, many don't. And what I feel for you, dear audience, is to continue watching her. The search is clear. Check me out. Check out my work. You might find something there. It's very simple to check me out. You put drwarter.com and my website will arise or you go to the other media of which I'm not so good that some helped me get into uh, YouTube and all these things. I want to express my love for you. Now, how can he love me if he doesn't even know? This is a recorded interview that will be transmitted somewhere in some time in another moment of nowness. Because love is the recognition of the same consciousness in others than in myself. And I get a little emotional with this. Because if I recognize that who you are and who I am, it's none of the above. That's like a surname. My surname is Warther. It comes from before. But my real surname is life. And your real surname is life. And we recognize the consciousness of life in each other. We love each other. That was beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Carlos, for being here today. And uh, I'll leave the website to Carlos below and you can find him there. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you so much for the interview. I'm so and thank you for watching everybody much light from the us and norway 
拜拜。Bye bye